Yeah, yeah, he's in America, yeah. Yeah. News, I could talk about that. News is that environment, because I'm from a news background. But I know that I, as brilliant and as, as, as fantastic as it was, I don't think I could have sustained that. Maybe I could have in a different lifestyle, but I think it's news, people are working, it's a different kind of working in news, and I do enjoy what I do. Yeah. 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 It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. I've got my warm boots out because it looks going to be cold. <laughs> so I've got things. I haven't. Act, they've been in the store for like. Well, six months in the, since last winter. So I've got them out. I know. Well, that's not bad, is it? I know. They, they, I haven't worn them that much. They're so warm. They're lovely. I hate having cold. Like, it makes your whole. You're cold all over, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yours is naturally like mine, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, they are. That's right. <laughs> they do because your hair just goes. It's true. It just still has a life. It has a life of its own anyway. But then with that, it's a no, no. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, we can start. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, we'll continue our afternoon sessions in Journalism and Media Week, dedicated to Channel 4, who made a home here in Leeds three years ago. And our next guest has a big role in Channel 4's vision to represent unheard voices across the whole of the UK. Please welcome Channel 4's creative diversity lead for Nations and Regions, Nyla Butt. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome, Nyla. It's a beautiful site as well, and it was really, it's a really nice location. I haven't been here before, so thank you for having me. And you slogged through late trains. Oh, I did. Let's not talk to about get trains. here. Yes, I did. I did. But I'm here now, and I'm glad. I, I'm glad I made it. So tell us, what what is the creative diversity lead role? What does it mean? So um, as we were, we were talking, so this is a new role. Um, I was very, very fortunate that I'm the first person to do this role. Um, and I think that's a, it's a unique opportunity. So if I give you a bit of background of where I was before. So before um, I joined Channel 4, I was at the BBC for more than 20 years, which I can't believe. Um, but it does fly by, literally. Um, and I'm from Birmingham. I don't know if you can... Um, 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 uh, get my accent in there but I, I lived in Birmingham um, and I worked in Birmingham for quite a long time mainly because of my children um, but I worked I was very fortunate that I um, at the BBC I started in journalism in local radio um, in telly and in uh, radio and then I um, was fortunate enough to move around the BBC um, especially in the Midlands so I worked in news I worked in telly worked in documentaries did a little bit of journalism I think in the late stage of my career as I started to enter the um, kind of like so so I have I mean this is my children are still fascinated by this I did read the news on the TV and on radio which was one of my favorite favorite jobs just because um, it was just something that somebody like me from Birmingham from a um, two up two down house I just never thought that I would end up reading the news at the BBC so that was something that I really enjoyed but I really enjoyed it anyway just the fast paceness of it the deadlines hitting on the hour writing your scripts knowing what's going on in the world um, but then I um, like many people kind of went into the editorial and into the senior um, kind of like leadership roles and became an editor um, and I worked in radio I worked in newsrooms 
uh, which was absolutely brilliant. It's such a good, and I was very fortunate to then, and, and that led me to the DNI space at the BBC. So I worked, I was the diversity editor just before I left there for um, your, um, all of the local radio stations and television um, stations. So that was basically what that means is that the people who are working there are representative of the audiences within those regions, um, and also the programmes that you make. So also what we say editorial and content is representative of the audiences. And that's really what I do here at the channel as well now at Channel 4. So I joined Channel 4 actually nearly three years ago, so they just opened in Leeds. And my role is based in Leeds, so I do come here quite often. Um, I haven't been for the last few months, but um, I do come here quite often. But then we also have a hub in Bristol, so I do go there as well. Um, and what is this role? So this role um, was fascinating. One, because as we said, it was the I was the first person to do it. But it's Channel 4's commitment, not just to ensuring that um, the nations and the regions, well, the regions are represented, but also that we're ensuring that the diverse makeup of those regions are represented. And that is not just in the um, content that, the, that Channel 4 makes, but also crucially, and that's what a big part of my role is, is the people who are making those programmes. So I work with a lot of... Um, what we say off screen um, kind of talent and off screen programs and making sure that all of our independent production companies um, are um, kind of like representing the audiences that they are making those prog the programs for and in the regions that they are. And I think we talked about what the main difference is between the Channel 4 and the BBC. And I think one of the biggest differences is, is that the independent production companies make all of Channel 4's content, whether that's digital content, whether that's the programs that you see on linear, what's the program, all, all of the content is made, is not made as we say, by channel, it's made by Channel 4, obviously, but it's made by independent production companies. And that was different for me at the BBC. Um, if I wanted to, if I had like a researcher that I knew, um, I could quite easily put them onto a project that I was leading on um, in terms of editorial. Here, we kind of recommend and go to, um, kind of like make the links with the independent production companies, which I think we're gonna go into as well. Did you notice a culture difference between the BBC and Channel 4? Yes. Um, I mean, the BBC is huge. It's kind of like, I mean, it's beyond your expectation how big the BBC is. When I worked in the central newsroom in London, which I did for about two years, we also um, kind of, there was a lot of um, connections and collaborations with the World Service. And when you start looking at the World Service, and there's, the, I think it's the fifth and the sixth floor of, of New Broadcasting House in London, and you just walk around that floor and you see all of the different languages and you see, so basically size, first and foremost, um, the international part of um, the BBC, it's huge. And it has its, you know, I'll be very frank, it does have its challenges when you're such a big, big institution. I remember that we worked on something that was called the race report. It was about um, getting senior leaders, getting more representation from um, different ethnicities with, into senior leadership across the BBC. And we were like, okay, we've got these six ideas. Um, and then you're like, okay, well, it's gonna be a little bit different for news and it's gonna be a bit different for them and it's gonna be a bit different. So size, yes. What's really good at Channel 4 is that we, we were, we're smaller, um, but, you're able to almost kind of um, the practicalities of some of the things that you're trying to put in place become a little bit easier. I won't say they're, e they're, they're really, really easy, but they are definitely, it's certainly more efficient and you can make more impact, I would say. So definitely in terms of size and that whole thing of, you're kind of one removed when it comes because it's the independent production companies that you have to work with. And so that's a, that's a different skill set actually that I had to almost kind of adapt and learn when I came to Channel 4. So you've talked about working in the DNI space and quite rightly in our work and our lives we're hearing the terms equality, diversity, yes. inclusion much more. But I'm not sure everyone can really use yeah. those terms with confidence and I hear equity and equality being used interchangeably. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference yeah. between those? Yeah, I mean, that's understandable. You know, that diversity, diversity, equality and inclusion is probably what is most people are familiar with, which kind of we all, most people are familiar with that that means that you are, you are giving people, equality essentially is about giving people equal opportunities when it comes to jobs or the programmes that we make. Um, it, it, it just kind of what it says on the tin in terms of opportunity. 
In the DNI space, things change a lot. We have to be very agile to the changing kind of um, challenges that we have, to the changing demographics. If you look at the census that was out last year or early, I don't know what year we're in, I don't know if it was last year or um, earlier this year, um, the demographics of the UK and across um, um, uh, 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 globally changes all the time. Um, and so we have to be quite agile in, in this space anyway. Um, so we've kind of equity is is a new phrase it's a relatively new phrase um, and what equity means in it, which is slightly different to equality is that you are given the same opportunities but you have to have this understanding that not everybody is starting from the same place so there will be different barriers different challenges for people so if you're putting there's a there's some really good graphics that i can share with you if you want afterwards and some really good films that you can you can find um on youtube or if you just put in equity and illustrations and it's kind of it's just ensuring that you understand the challenges that different people have um, if they have for example for the region that they come from they may have a disability um, you know we still aren't haven't quite got the gender balance yet in, in terms of men and women um, LGBTQ plus all those different challenges that you know individuals have that's just some of them you know that's just some of them now we have we we also go kind of even deeper than that in people kind of like coming from two parent families people who have been fostered all these different nuances that people have that's essentially where equity comes in and it's having an understanding of those individuals and some of the barriers and challenges that they may face that others may not so you're the first person to take on this role Yes. How do you shape a role with no precedent? Oh gosh, um, I mean it's really exciting. It's quite it's quite scary as well. Um, I think that you have to have an understanding of the remit of the channel, which was great. So you have to kind of have an understanding of what it is that Channel Four stands for. What is it the kind of programs that they're trying to make? I think having an understanding, like I said at the start, about the Channel Four's commitment to the regions. So that's obviously a huge part of um, kind of kind of like their remit but also like okay so but there are there are differences so what we do in Leeds is probably not going to be the same as what we do in um, Cardiff or what we do in Birmingham or what we do in Manchester or Bristol so it's having an understanding of um, what the different nuances within those regions are um, and and still yes you can have some general kind of ideas of what what it is that you want to want you know general ideas of representation but it's having an understanding of that so that's quite exciting so knowing your your regions which I did because I I worked in the regions previously I think it's also that you kind of you can mold it so you can have you can be quite creative and you can kind of um, say well okay I think that we need to be doing lots of work um, on the ground with partners who are perhaps already working in that in 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 that area or in the creative industries and building partnerships there as well so it it it's quite nice it's quite challenging as well I'm still trying to do different things and even three nearly three years in still there are still um, lots of things that we could do um, but it has grown actually since I've started it it has grown in the sense of that I've been given kind of bigger projects or bigger um, not so much responsibilities but but kind of like a wider range if you like it's not just in Leeds or in Birmingham in Manchester like the big cities we're now looking at okay well there's a really good um, Northeast as well you know we know that there's a creative industry there that has been un, un, underfunded or whatever for, for a long time so there are still challenges and it can grow and, and not every day is the same which is also brilliant as well and then just hopefully this works until they need a hard, a hard press Thanks, Mark. Um, just bringing up the commissioning yes. guidelines here, because obviously, you know, completely understand there are regional nuances. <laughs> yes. But Channel 4 has certain expectations yes. around yeah, we do. Um, diversity and commissioning. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? So the diversity guidelines are um, something that our department, so the creative diversity team, we are kind of responsible for putting these together. And what they are is they are an expectation and a guide um, for all of our independent production companies that work with us or make content for us. It's almost kind of like a guide of what we expect when it comes to representation. So, for example, we expect... 20% of your um, production team um, to be of um, a black, Asian or ethnic 
background, those are the people who are making the programmes. Um, now that can't always happen in the if you're a, if you're in like I said in Cardiff and maybe not even in Leeds maybe it doesn't because we know that there is a shortage of and certainly again within those guidelines we have um, mandated particular senior roles because we feel that there is a lack of and it's not just our industry I think generally there's a lack of representation when it comes to ethnicity within senior senior leadership roles so we've kind of mandated that um, but we also understand that um, this is not always possible um, so we kind of have that relationship with the indies and we have this um, kind of little nuance when it comes to um, regionality as well we also ask for in terms of content so we we are very closely working with we say that if you are um, that you have to have particular representation within your editorial and within your content now that that can be that can be interpreted in lots of different ways it can be interpreted in a tokenism kind of way that okay we've got a black person or we've got an asian person or we've got a disabled person therefore we've got our representation that's not quite what we mean um we want there to be an understanding and authenticity behind the storytelling and and um why you've got particular people on screen whether that is unscripted so we're talking about docu um, documentaries factual entertainment um all the different genres as well as within scripted which is where is drama and comedy as well so there are little things like that within our guidelines and we really we put a lot of we put a lot of thought and research into those so we use a lot of data so we look at the census like i mentioned so we look at the makeup of the uk and where you know that the that the expectations that we are putting onto our indies or the people who are working with us are actually feasible and you know so there is a there is a science to some some kind of science to it and then we also have lots and lots of other research that we have ourselves we have in-house research about what representation where there are gaps where there are people who are not quite represented so we know that disability representation both on and off screen may look it may look like it's doing really really well but actually when you look at the figures and you look at the data it's actually something that we're not quite there yet so though those are the kind of things that our guidelines help along with so how do we help we have lots and lots of different programs we have lots of contacts with what we say talent and that that's kind of your researchers your producers your directors your runners um, all from different backgrounds and then we put them in touch with our indies um, and kind of like link them with lots and lots of different events that our team runs um, we've got a team of about six people um, which sounds like a sounds like a lot but actually we we're, we're overrun but that's a real credit to the commissioning um, department because they always always come to us with lots and lots of kind of like questions ideas check in with us so we know that they are um, as committed to it as we are if that makes sense it does and we heard from some of the fantastic commissioners yes. at channel 4 this morning um so there was a really big moment for representation at channel 4 in your first year in post which was the black to front day in yes. september 2021 yeah. and we have a trailer from that day if Brilliant. you wouldn't mind showing us that mark Everyone. Welcome to Countdown on Friday, September the 10th. Welcome to this special edition of Channel 4 News. After the death of George Floyd, there was a debate that rumbled through, I think, all of society about representation in lots of different areas of life. And one of the most conspicuous areas where there was really striking underrepresentation of, of black people was the media, telly in particular. What if we did something really radical, quite controversial, not everybody might like it? What if you turned on your television one day and everybody that you saw was black? What would that mean for black viewers? What would that mean for um, non-black viewers? And what would that mean for the way that we make television for that day and for content moving forward? My initial reaction was to think, well, Channel 4's now gone from being a channel that was meant to be diverse all the time to a channel that's going to be diverse just for one day. It was a conscious decision by Channel 4 to increase diversity. energy on screen was huge, especially the Big Breakfast, really felt like a special, special part of the day. From the moment that went on air, it crackled with energy. It was so emotional, it was such an incredible atmosphere, in fact we were in tears. Not only did we see 
black people in all of the shows throughout the schedule. Not only did we know that a large number of black people have been involved in making those shows, whether it was new shows like High Life or new show like Unapologetic, we had two great young black hosts and we discussed a range of issues from a black perspective. I'm seeing people on screen that I've seen work for years and years and years and I'm seeing them being recognised. Why? Why have we waited this long for a national broadcaster to have a major news bulletin edited by a black person? So I was incredibly happy but tinged with anger. It was brilliant. I had so many people call me, talk about it. Oh my gosh, I loved it. My, my daughter loved it. My son loved it. There were black adverts as well. The commercials in between. There were black continuity voices. And it was just incredible to be seen and feel seen for once. I thought one of the most spectacular things on the day was how all the adverts had changed. There were 50 or 60 new adverts shot just for the day. And all of that together made a tremendous impact on screen. It felt like we were suddenly transported to a different universe. So important for young girls and boys that look like us to see us on TV. It's all about representation. So I've got a young daughter myself and I'm so happy knowing that she's grown up seeing black representation on TV. When people saw the day itself, they realised that there was something about the sheer scale and the energy of the day and the way in which it seemed to unlock the possibility of more change that really felt like this might be the beginning of something quite significant. The legacy of this day has to be the opportunity to showcase our talent and say, hey, we're good enough. We're putting added impetus in delivering black stories and ethnically diverse stories and talent onto the channel. And also following feedback from the Lenny Henry Centre, we are completely overhauling our commissioning guidelines, which will put diversity at the forefront for everyone we work with across the board. We were a critical friend in the true sense. If we want an industry that we all love, then we need to actually engage with things which might be a bit scary. One of the initiatives that we're going to see around disability, around Asian inclusion, around gender, and sexuality. It was always envisaged to be disruptive. It was always going to be controversial. Um, and it was all of those things. However, if we look at what we're doing now, as a result of that controversy, as a result of that disruption, for me, for us, I think it's 100% worth it because we're doing more now than ever before. Wow. It does make me feel just make me feel very proud and very emotional, actually, very emotional, actually, as well, seeing all of that. Incredible trailer, and I'm sure it was an incredible day. Yeah. But that was two years ago. Yes. Um, so, you know, how much of a leap did it feel to do yeah. that compared to what Channel 4 aims to do day yeah. in, day out? Yeah. And um, what happened next? Yep. So um, there's some really brilliant, brilliant stories in there, and it really captures um, kind of the real... Ian talks a lot about audacity. It was kind of like the audacious way and it was an intervention that had never been done actually. Nobody's done that before ever across the world where you've changed all of your content and made it totally, um, not when I say all over the world, it's kind of like the, the main broadcasters. Um, and it was, it was, it wasn't just about the day, although as huge and as phenomenal and as um, uh, challenging as it was um, with the adverts and getting all of those presenters changed and all the programmes changed, it was all about the legacy. Um, and we were heavily involved in that. Um, and as Marcus Ryder, who, who you heard there, who was our critical friend and who we worked with in terms of, well, what happens next? Well, um, and again, as Shaminda alluded to, um, there was a commitment to having um, a, a significant number of black-led indies, um, and they are black-led independent production companies, to work and to, to get them commissioned, essentially, because essentially that's, that's where you make the change. Um, so that was one of the commitments, um, and that has, has been happening gradually. Um, then there was the commitment on content, so it wasn't necessarily that... You see, this is where the nuances come in, you see, um, where it wasn't just that if there was a, if there was a black led independent pr production company, they had to tell a black story, um, or they had to make content that was, you know, that is great and it's authentic, but it's also they can make something like um, uh, a 
you know, a new game show or a, or a documentary series, um, which we also know that we did with um, one of our, um, I don't know if you saw the documentary about the um, GI babies, which was something that came out of um, one of the directors, the black director, Alex Thomas, who worked with us on First Cut, which is another program for first directors. But this was a story about um, US soldiers who had come over to the UK um, black soldiers and had children over here but had given them up for adoption because of the colour of their skin essentially because it wasn't you know having mixed race babies at that time so, so, so those kind of things we know that it's, it's made an effect in content in terms of from some of the work that I'm we're doing in our team so as we talked about earlier, we've been talking about it before, um, programs like the Momentum program, which is um, the second year, we're in our second iteration, working with Jade and Four Skills, um, uh, which is 60, um, is, that, is that on there now? Sorry, here we go. <laughs> yeah, which is um, our 60 filmmakers from across the regions who will be mentored um, by um, lots of people at Channel 4, lots of our partners in the independent production companies, a six month program, which includes masterclass classes which includes a showcase um, at the channel so we bring them in and talk to them about their um, filmmaking but crucially connect them with our independent production companies so they can go on and work on our programs as well so that's one of the really significant um, programs that we did what's the other one that's up there oh gosh this one how can I forget so as a result of um, uh, Black to Front Somebody got in touch with one of our um, heads of documentaries who's now left. Um, Danny Horan actually should take the credit for making that, getting the starting point for this. Um, and it's somebody called Emma Butt, no relation. Everybody thinks we're related, but we're not. Um, but she worked in post-production. And she, this, this kind of um, motivated her to get in touch and say, you're doing great stuff here on kind of the, the traditional roles within television, but actually post-production is so underrepresented. Um, it's just the same people doing the same job for 30, 40 years. So she wrote a report on it and then she got in touch with us and it took us a while, um, but we, about six months ago, I think we launched our very first, what we call 4PP, which is the Channel 4 Post-Production Placement Program. And what that does is we've got, uh, we, we've only managed to fund seven at the moment, but we're hoping to expand next year. And they are post-production roles. So you're editing, sound, um, kind of visual effects, um, specialists within those in post-production um, and getting, getting um, diverse talent from there and putting them onto our um, programs on a placement and giving them training, giving them mentoring as well. Um, so it's that kind of real grassroots level, if you like. We know that it's, it's a small scale in terms of the wider industry, but I think with both of these, um, we want to kickstart, kind of motivate other other broadcasters and the rest of the industry as well. So you always want to be, we don't always want to be, but we like to be industry leading in lots of these things. And the post-production is also the first ever of its kind. I've realized that there's a lot of first evers that we've done as well here. So yeah, but that we hope, post-production, we're very proud of because um, we really, really want the rest of the industry to also take note. And we hope that it kickstarts a change in representation there as well. Brilliant. And most of the people in the audience here this afternoon are trying to find stories, making content. Mm. What's your advice to our students in telling authentic stories yeah. and representing unheard voices? Yeah, yeah. I think that there is, gosh, there is so much that so much advice that you can give. But I think that always think about the per think about the lens that the story is being told through um, what we talk about uh, we talk that we talk about that a lot at channel 4 because if you look at the nature of the programs that we make you know they are quite authentic it's through the lens of the people who are telling it so um, I would not probably be able to tell um, a story about somebody who has um, a particular disability maybe so always always think about those those the authentic lens, the lens that you're telling the story through, first of all. A good story is a good story. That doesn't matter who it's from and where it's from. So always think about what is the story that is going to get people 
interested in watching um, and then also think about how you are going to tell that story so what's the story narrative what's the story arc and I remember this is just a tip that and I'll never forget it when I did my journalism course in Birmingham 20 odd years ago and we were just in one of the sessions that we had and one of the we didn't we weren't told that this was going to happen so we went in in the morning um, and our our um, tutor she said right you're all going out you've got two hours I want you to you just go out out of the building or even in the building but when you come back I want you to bring me three original stories basically and I was like oh my god we were all like what what how are we, how are we going to and actually if you go if it's just when you look around you there is a story to tell everywhere you there really really is and you just talk to people don't you can be a bit nosy that's all right I'm quite nosy um you know talk to people have that kind of listen to people listening is so so important to hear um, what their stories are and also if there is a story in, there's a story inside all of us and sometimes it's actually our own stories that inspire others and then you know it was certainly like that with me that I realized actually um, I'm quite interested in other people's stories but I've got quite an interesting story to tell so you try and bring some of yourself um, within that but if you're if you don't have experience of it going back to your um, authenticity point really seek out experts and seek out the people whose lives it is that you're representing seek out the people um, who have lived through or have lived experience of the stories that you're you're trying to tell because I tell you now the in terms of the media industry and the landscape you people will be able to within 30 seconds know whether this story is authentic or not and also they've got so many alternatives alternatives to go and find those authentic stories on different platforms as well so yeah there's quite a lot of advice in there but the, it's, <laughs> it's it's kind of different bits of advice and that's actually because of the landscape changing the landscape has changed so much there is so much competition that people will find the content that they want and that is authentic to them well let's hear from some other voices right now <laughs> over to our audience um, for your questions and I think the first one, first one was here on the front row, and then I put the back. If that's even, oh, yeah, it's on. Uh, thank you for being here today because it's great to show, um, uh, great to show diversity. And obviously, I live with disability, and I'm on many forums for it um, and stuff like that. And I think it's dead, dead important. Mm. Um, because obviously, there's still room for improvement. How would you improve uh, getting more diverse people in send? different cultures, uh, different people uh, who come from like, racial backgrounds and even people who come from, uh, who might be LGBTQ plus. Yeah. Um, yeah. How would you get them into the, how would how can we try and get them into the um, industry a lot yeah. more? Yeah, so I think that we, I think that there's always, you're right, there's always room for improvement. So we have lots of um, partnerships uh, with various organizations. So my colleagues who work, um, who are specialists in the disability area, they work with somebody called DTP TV, which is about disabled and deaf people in television. So they will have a whole host of um, um, kind of contacts and they run a, they have a database of people who are in the industry um, in, in terms of kind of not just storytelling, but on and off screen talent, as we say. So I think that there are, lot, you know, working with the right partners, I think that always looking at actually looking at what talent is out there so almost kind of like a scouting um, if you like so always looking at what is it who haven't we seen who haven't we heard from you know we do get this um, kind of the, the, there's a word that they use that it's kind of like you roll out the same people all the time but actually there is new talent out there across the board so always looking for new talent and we work with um, e4 we have a we work with our digital um, uh, digital uh, commissioners as well who have lots and lots of programs where they actually go out and seek new talent from those diverse communities as well so we're, we're constantly constantly looking like I said a lot of the work that I do is particularly with off screen so that's with all your producers your researchers your runners um, and actually senior lead, senior roles like directors and um, series producers as well so we we actively um, seek them out if you like and have various programs that we do for doing that yeah. I think we had a question up at the back here. Hi. I just wanted to ask what you feel you personally have brought to your role as creative and diversity lead. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think just my experience. I think that I'm very fortunate to have worked in so many different areas of the media. Um, that, you know, I, I was talking to Catherine earlier, you know, my background is in news. I think that that 
is such a good, such good grounding for uh, working long hours, um, working to tight deadlines, like I just said about finding those original authentic stories. Um, I think that I also bring, um, so I bring lots and lots of experience. Um, I'm quite outspoken, you'd be very surprised to hear. Um, I'm, I, I've worked with some very, very senior people um, across the BBC. When I was at the BBC, um, I think in the last kind of two years that I was there, um, we worked through the Jimmy Savile um, kind of scandal. We worked through the um, uh, Equal Pay uh, was going on when I was there. And I was working with the very senior leadership kind of in times of almost crisis management about how you deal with kind of those kind of crisis. And the last one, the last one I say, um, was the whole thing around Naga Manchetti. I don't know if any of you remember where she made a comment. Um, just she, you know, as we all would, anybody um, who is Black, Asian, or an eth ethnic minority or ethnic from a particular ethnicity, um, when Donald Trump said something like "Go back home," um, we construe that as racist. Um, as other people do as well, who are not of, of colour. But um, there was a huge controversy at the BBC um, about uh, her being reprimanded, actually, for saying that. So I think that what I uniquely bring is that I'm not afraid to talk to power, if that makes sense. We have lots of very good meetings with Ian. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's really surprising that the very senior people, which probably isn't said very often, are very open to people like us um, who can bring them a different perspective and bring them a different um, outlook and bring your experiences. So I hope that's what I've brought to the role. But thank you, great question. Just over here, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hi. <laughs> you mentioned that you can find stories uh, just by listening to people. Mm -hmm. um, are there any stories that you found that have surprised you the most? Oh, gosh. Um, I think this role um, is quite, it's quite tasking, like you are, I, I think that you would be surprised actually at some people's experiences within this industry and they will, will come to you and say, well, I've not had a very good experience because this has happened to me on you know, some of the biggest, I won't say which ones, but some of the biggest, biggest programs where you think that they would know better and how to um, kind of treat people and uh, be able to embrace diversity and be different, you know, uh, embrace difference and, and kind of, you know, you kind of do it so well publicly, but actually I think that's probably one of the really difficult, difficult parts of the role. I think there's also, I remember once, this is way back, um, that I was working on The Breakfast Show uh, in Birmingham on the Asian Network, and uh, there were some elections going on, and we had to, we had to interview Nick Griffin um, from the BNP because that's what was happening. In election times, you have to talk to all of the political parties. And I remember that I was, one of the, I was one of the people who had to ring him up and put him through to the studio. First of all, have a chat with him to say, what is he going to say and what, you know, what's he going to talk about? Those are the kind of difficult, quite challenging things um, that, that kind of, you know, really go to. But you have to, you, you know, you're professional, you have to do the jobs. I think there was one other one, um, and actually that's from somebody in Leeds. So I remember, um, again, I was at the Asian Networks and there was, a, there, was a, there, was a, there was a man here, and I forget his name. I think his surname was Mirza. Um, and he had been in prison in Pakistan for about 20 years and he got released um, and was put on a plane with our reporter here from BBC Leeds, was brilliant, Sanjeev, who actually runs Radio Leeds now. Um, he he put, got on a plane and we got the exclusive interview and he was, he was like, had been, he'd been done, it was like done for murder or something. And I was like, oh my God, this guy, he's like just come from prison. Um, he's probably not seen any other people like before, like for 20 years and we had to interview him as well. So there are, you know, those are the kind of things that stick out in your mind, some of the stories stories. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the NCTJ says that, you know, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds mm. are underrepresented with 80% of journalists being from professional or upper class backgrounds. And I know that you're part of a new study at the moment to analyse like socioeconomic backgrounds of all of your staff. Mm. What do you hope to gain from that? 
So I think I, that's, that's one of the groups, and we were talking about this earlier, weren't we? Um, I think that's one of the areas of D&I that has not quite, um, we haven't quite cracked how it is that you become more representative. I think that it's getting better. Um, I think journalism uh, uh, is probably one of those that it's almost kind of like the reputation of it as well. It's about the kind of like, well, you know, what it's about telling people's stories. And sometimes journal, journalists don't have the greatest reputa re, uh, reputation. So I think it's changing a bit of the mindset of that. I think that it is about absolutely, you know, people who have money and people who have um, who are able to get the training because there's a lot of training involved in journalism for the for the right reasons. Um, so I think that one of the things that we should be looking at, and I don't know whether we will, because I, I, I'm not quite sure what we will get out of this study, we'll certainly look at recommendations, um, but it's about making sure that um, people have the support, whether it's economic support, whether it's social support, whether it's the um, kind of almost introduction to the industry to say that this is an industry for all, um, whether it's journalism or television. Television has been accused of the same thing as well. Um, but I think it's definitely something that is an area, if you like, of um, the diversity and equity space that we talk about equity. That's a real key part of equity that people who um, are, you know, you can apply for the same job and apply for the same um, course, but actually, do you have the finances for it? Are you in the right region for the course, um, for the best courses as well? So a lot of that work will go on and then think about um, what those recommendations are and then hopefully um, we can put some of those in place. Um, I was just wondering what the criteria was for the mentoring uh, program. Do you need a qualification? Do you need to be studying or could someone like me apply? I'm not studying here. I'm not a student here yet. Um, I volunteer as a presenter slash reporter for Bradford Community um, yeah. Radio. So that mentoring scheme, we um, we are partners with it. So we provide the mentors and we provide um, some of the um, funding for the masterclasses. I th we are Parable, the organisation. They run that mentoring scheme, uh, that particular one. Um, but there are all sorts of all sorts of programmes that you can get involved in. I would look at something like Screen Skills, look at the film and TV charity, um, look at anything that's happening here regionally. Um, it's not just, it's not just, um, we, we don't directly run the programs. The 4PP we did, but that was because Emma Butt was brilliant and she had the, she had the kind of, she worked very closely with us when we were recruiting for that, but that was much smaller. Um, I think that you should look at your kind of local, um, uh, any, anywhere that you can ha anywhere that you can get onto a program that will get you mentored. So um, it's different criteria for different. You can get what we say entry level. You can get kind of mid to senior, mid level. Our one that we did for for um, post production was actually mid to senior level. We didn't do entry level because we think that entry level is is quite well resourced and quite well. Um, um, like there's a lot of programs for that, but actually it's mid to senior level. So we kind of that's where I said that's what I said about when we we look at the data and we look at research. We look we look at lots of research and say right where are the gaps that we need to fill? Who's missing from um, our our kind of people who are making our programs? And then kind of do it like that. So, but I'm happy for you to share details if you want to get in touch. That's fine. I just have a real yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. Hang on. Let right? me get my notes out. It's, um, good. Yeah. it's good to be curious. Yes, and I've got always lots of notes as well. <laughs> um, so the, um, was it back to front? Black to Black front. Black to front, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wondered if that was... <laughs> I don't, well, you'll probably remember the controversy over the Sainsbury, Sainsbury's Black Family advert, the Christmas, and I just wondered if that was part of um, uh, the backlash. Yeah. Do you, do you remember the... I don't, I don't, I don't recall Can that. Can you tell yeah. us what the What's, controversy what was, the story? was? So in 2020, there was lots of fury over a black family, a Sainsbury's advert, Christmas, so the, and a lot of um, yeah. racism on social media that they didn't like a black family. Oh, they didn't like a black family. Yeah, now I remember. Yeah, so yeah. they didn't like that there was a there was a. So it was it was the backlash was that it's a black family in the Sainsbury's advert. Do you know what? Who cares? You know, you can be racist. You know, who cares? 
that you know you can have backlash and you can have that's not going to stop people like us or Channel Four. Was the uh, black to front kind of part of the decision to get more black families on on screen so that yeah. we're not putting up with this? Yeah. Um, so 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 in terms of the, we had nothing to do with the Sainsbury's ad. That wasn't anything to do with us. What we did with our own advertising. So the the decision to have all of the adverts as well on the day. I mean, I I still can't believe that we did that. I think we start, still can't believe that we managed to do that. Sixty new adverts. Rep with um, representation as in on screen, so the people that you see and the stories that they tell um, to be solely black content is a huge, is a huge step um, and intervention within the ad. In so that's not television, that's in the ad industry. And I think that what, what, the, what our sales team found was that, and there is a session actually that they did for us in the inclusion festival, which that talks in much more detail about the process. But what that did is that they went in and changed their mindset. They were like, actually, you're right. You know, we haven't got representation and we haven't got, um, we haven't got, you know, people who are making the adverts, let alone the people who are on, on screen. Because on screen is quite easy to do. You know, on screen you can find lots of actors and lots of um, presenters and lots of people who can come on screen and you can get um, your representation right. It's actually the people who are, and we, this goes back to authenticity, about the people who are making the programs, about the people who are making the films, about the people who are making those adverts. And we know that there are some really big commercial partners who have changed their own, the ways of working and being more inclusive and being more um, kind of representative in just where they get their ideas from and who's who's on screen and what the stories are going to be about. So, um, yeah, so we weren't involved in the Sainsbury's, but there was a real mindset and culture change within the advert the kind of commercial partners that we worked with in in ad sales and um, what sorry what i was pleased about was when um channel 4 did made sure that they kept playing that advert and they were saying that they were standing up to racism so i was really really pleased to yeah. see that yeah yeah they'll do that yeah and i'm afraid we are out of time oh. i'm very <laughs> much <went> quick <laughs> it, it did go really quick, quick. Yeah. it did go quick very <laughs> very much look forward to hearing what you do next with channel four and what um comes out of some of these fantastic schemes yes. maybe we'll have future guests in journalism yes. media week um yeah. big round of applause please for nyla thank you